Good afternoon, and thank you everyone for coming today. And today I had the opportunity to share with you one of my greatest passions in music, and that is improvisation. And when you hear the word improvisation, you might think of a jazz musician. They improvise all the time. Uh, but they're not the only ones who improvise. Organists improvise, and there, there's improvisation from many other cultures uh, in their music. Uh, but the kind of improvisation I'm going to talk about today uh, is actually within classical music. So many of us are music performance majors here studying classical music, and actually improvisation uh, was a part of that. So let me just briefly give a definition of that. So let's begin. Okay, so according to the New Oxford American Dictionary, to improvise means to create and perform spontaneously or without preparation. And I highlighted the key words here, create, perform, spontaneously, and without preparation. Okay, so it's a very creative activity that we do. Isn't that perfect for the School of Culture and Creativity? And that's what we do. Uh, spontaneously or without preparation. So that's going to be in real time. Okay, so I will play something um, for the second half of this presentation, and it will be something that I have never performed before. I'm going to make it up on the spot. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, furthermore, uh, I was inspired by our school's motto. I'm sure you all know it. Knowledge and it leads unto the whole person. And I thought, well, improvisation is such a great activity to do to improve our musicianship as a whole, okay, because, well, we want to produce well-rounded students here uh, through our multidisciplinary curriculum, and we want our students to be able to connect all of these disciplines that they study and not just be specialists in one area. Okay, so I think improvisation is a perfect fit for uh, what we do here as, uh, as UIC community members. And so there's creativity, there's a sense of being well-rounded, interdisciplinary, and these are all key words that are uh, associated with improvisation. So I want to make another connection between music and language and show you how improvisation fits into this. So uh, maybe you speak uh, more than one language, and if you've ever studied a language, you may have, uh, you may understand these Concepts are these are the four basic modes of verbal communication. There's reading, writing, listening, and speaking. And in music, we have these components as well. And these are the four pillars, and these are the basic skills that we need to master if we really want to speak the language of music well. But it's not enough to just know these skills individually, we have to be able to connect them together. And this is where the whole musicianship really lies. Okay, so there's style composition, audiation. Audiation is being able to hear what's on the page. And then transcription is taking something that you listen to and then you write it down. And then score reading, you read what's on the page and you perform it. Playing by ear, you hear something in your head and then you play it. And improvisation I put with composition and performance now. For example, improvisation, you it's hard to improvise without playing by ear because you know, you're creating an idea, you hear it in your head, and then you play it by ear. Okay, so all of these skills are interrelated. And so that's what uh, improvisation, along with these other skills, are really good for. So that's one of the reasons that I think we should improvise. So that's the first point over here, musicianship training. There are a few other reasons why I think we should improvise. Uh, there are some practical applications. So you know, if you want to accompany uh, a dance company, they have rehearsals, you, you improvise some kind of dance, and then the dancers dance to it. Uh, if you want to accompany a choir, if you want to be a church musician, if you want to be a jazz musician, and take on some gigs that require improvisation. And by the way, a lot of these activities that I mentioned are uh, paying gigs so 
It doesn't hurt to know how to improvise. You can earn a buck or two. Uh, another reason why we should improvise is because some of the repertoire that we play actually calls for improvisation. For example, we have Cadenza's uh, Mozart Concerti. So uh, that offers the performer an opportunity to just take a solo. The orchestra stops playing, it's just the pianist, and uh, they can have a go at it. However, uh, a lot of pianists these days tend not to do that as much because it's kind of risky. So a lot of pianists I know, uh, they uh, you know, borrow another composer's written out uh, cadenza or they write their own, but uh, you know, improvisation is a bit risky. Uh, on the other hand, I think it's a lot of fun. And so we improvise for enjoyment. And I personally think improvisation is lower stakes. You know, because you know, if somebody tells you, oh, wow, that sounded so great. And then I just said, yeah, well, I was just improvising. So on the other hand, if it doesn't go so well, you can just say, oh, I was just improvising. Yeah. So I think there's a lot of fun that we can have with improvisation. And by the way, if you have any questions, uh, during the presentation, feel free to stop me and I'd be happy to answer them. Okay? So, uh, today I want to talk about how improvisation was taught uh, before uh, in the context of how musicians were trained uh, before and now how they are trained and how does improvisation fit nowadays. So, in the 17th and 18th centuries in Europe, we had musicians who did a whole ensemble of uh, jobs, basically. They wore many hats as a composer, as a performer, composer, teacher, conductor, theorist. They're all of these, and they were known for all of these aspects of their musical careers. Okay, so all the composers we uh, revere as great composers, like Beethoven, Mozart, Bach, they all improvised, but they all composed, they performed. Now Bach had 20 children, and he had time to be a daddy. So, he, he did everything. Now, um, things are a bit different. So, musicians tend to specialize in certain sub-disciplines. So performers, we tend to just do our performance thing. That's what we do. Composers, they just compose. Conductors, they conduct. And so, when we sort of specialize in one area, and the good thing about that is, you know, the level of uh, artistic achievement is really, really high. I think uh, we can you know, thank the musicians today for bringing the artistic level to new heights. But at the same time, I think we are losing something when we only focus on one area and not uh, fully train all of the musicians' skills. And I think nowadays, uh, it's sort of making a comeback. So I think that's a very exciting time to be in. So, um, in Italy, in the 17th and 18th centuries, there's this improvisation method called partimento. And, and it was, uh, it originated in Naples, it's a city in Italy, and uh, it was used to teach these orphan girls at these Italian conservatories, and Partimento improvisation was one of the things that they learned. And through this process, among with some other uh, teachings, you know, they became great musicians. And other countries and other uh, conservatories throughout Europe began to take notice and said, hey, this is pretty good. The results are pretty good. Let's see what we can do. Let's adapt it. So this, this method was very popular. Uh, but uh, as we know, it, died out a little bit in the 20th century, and then now uh, we're trying to uh, bring it back into the realm of piano playing. So here I have up here a bass line. This one in particular is by Francesco Durante, and it sounds something like this. Is just 
the baseline, and the improviser is asked to improvise something over it. And so these uh, Italian treatises uh, sometimes give us some hints on how to do that. There's no single authoritative treatise out there, but uh, if you take a collection of all of these uh, snippets of ideas here and there, put them together, I think you would sort of get the idea. So Durante suggests something like this, or something like this. Anyway, this is there are many ways we can elaborate a baseline, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. So, again, I think of improvisation much like the learning a language. So, of course, we have to learn the rules, learn the patterns, arrange the patterns, and then we have to express ideas and emotions. So, it has to make sense, not only make sense, but it has to say something substantial when we improvise, which is uh, quite challenging to do, but that's the purpose of music. So, and there are these linguistic equivalents to uh, the components that I just mentioned. So let me start with grammar. So I could start with the harmonic series, uh, but that's opening up a can of worms. So uh, I'll start with the rule of the octave. So this was a well-known rule in our scare quotes. Uh, this rule is not really a hard rule, but it's just a guideline. So, so you have a scale in the bass line. For every note in the bass, and for every scale degree in the bass, you can associate a certain set of notes. We call those chords. So certain chords we can associate with each bass note. So this is one, uh, one common version of it, but many composers had their own versions and substitutions and uh, this is just the sort of the default, the vanilla flavor, if I like to call it. So let me play it for you. Right. 
you said that. But then you might ask, well, we played it in the wrong key. Well, then I say, well, we need to actually learn these patterns in all the keys, and not just be able to play it in one key. And so, you know, sort of the, the pieces that are written are sort of one of the possible uh, realizations that you can have. So let's uh, continue. So that's the grammar. So I used the rule of the octave as a harmonic foundation for harmonizing single bass notes. But then we can string these bass notes together in such a way that it makes a pattern that sort of makes sense on its own. Okay, so I'm not going to play each one of these, but these are some common patterns. Um, we can also call them schemata. So let me play the first one along with some musical examples maybe you'll be familiar with. So 
configurations for the same baseline. So when you try this, there are many ways to come up with these configurations. Uh, but as we'll later see, uh, the types of configurations that we choose depend a lot on the character of the piece. We'll get into that in a bit. So the vocabulary can consist of a harmonic language as well as some melodic configurations uh, in both parts. So now I'd like to talk about the syntax. So that means arranging the patterns. So we take these patterns and then string them together like Lego pieces. So here's the first pattern that I showed you. So uh, theorists like to call this the Romanesca pattern. And then we'll follow that up with a printer and a half cadence. This time I'm going to change the ending a little bit, so it's going to have a different cadence. First page of the well tempered clavier, the Bach, the that piece, uses that pattern, so he calls it the page one. And then we'll follow it by a couple of different patterns, different formulas. Some work better at the end, some work better in both positions uh, or in the middle somewhere. Uh, but it really depends. You just have to sort of practice seeing what works and what doesn't work. This sets the syntax, arranging the patterns. So once we've done all of that, now we have to say something substantial. So in the Baroque period, we have what we call the doctrine of affections. And the idea behind this is that for every musical parameter, such as a key or interval or articulation, there's a particular emotion or character that is associated. And theorists and composers uh, at that time, they had their own ideas about uh, what these associations could or should be. So here's just a sample of uh, some associations that I came up with. Uh, they, you may or may not agree with me, but um, yeah, for example, C major, it says it's very innocent because it's all the white keys, very pure. In C minor, it's tragic. You know, think about this Beethoven's Pathetic Sonata. It's full of um, tragedy and uh, seriousness. And so every key sort of has its own character. Now, today, the pianos that we play on are tuned to equal temperament. That means all the half step intervals are the same. But at the time, in the Baroque period, the keyboard instruments were not tuned that way, and every key servant had a different flavor because of the unequal intervals between the half steps. So now they heard even a, even a greater difference between each key. So the emotional qualities were even more pronounced. And you can do the same thing for the intervals besides the keys. So here I showed you some melodic intervals. I mean, these, this is not an exhaustive list. These are just some that I picked. Okay, so here are some intervals, and depending on the direction, it might have a different character of mood. So for example, minor second, maybe if you go up by a half step, there's a longing sense, whereas where if, you, if you go down, you might feel a sense of lament. And actually, there's a pattern that takes advantage of these descending half steps. We call it the chromatic lament bass. So I hope you can hear those 
the Sunday cab steps really show a, lament, a lamenting kind of character. And paired with a key like G minor, which is very serious and somber, you know, I think it's really effective in bringing up these emotional qualities. So that's something to consider when we improvise. Yes, we have the, just to recap, we have the foundation of the rule of the octave, and then we extract these harmonic patterns, these melodic configurations, and then we put them all together, and then we say something meaningful with that vocabulary that we uh, practiced. So that's sort of the procedure behind improvisation. So, any questions so far? I know this is a lot of material. Okay, I find this all really fascinating. I hope you do too. Oh, by the way, here's a little... Uh, I think there is a question on there. <laughs> sorry, sorry. I'm so sorry. Yes. I have a question. Yeah, I Yes, so of course the, the rule of the octave was uh, very relevant in the Baroque and classical period. Romantic period, it depends on the composer, but certainly Brahms knew about it, Schumann knew about it. If you look at their songs, look, look at their symphony, look at their piano works, it's, you know, it's written all over the, all over the place. Um, when you get into the 20th century composers with you know, you know, 12 tone music, okay, maybe it doesn't work for that. But it's surprising that it's actually um, you know, quite omnipresent in the Baroque and classical music anyway, and a lot of the romantic repertoire as well. So it would be interesting to go back and take a look at the repertoire that you're studying and see if you can find these rule of the octave harmonizations. Yeah, so I would say, so the rule of the octave is still the foundation, but then it just kept evolving to include more dramaticism, and you know, it, it sort of evolved into its own own thing until you know, it doesn't you know look like what it originally looked like before. So yes, thank you for your question. Okay, so yeah, I, I found this image on the map and it's a fun uh, description of the rule of the object.